level. So we say run it slightly to the scaling side. Because if you get a little scale on a surface, a little mineral precipitation, you can remove it. No harm. You can remove it, but you cannot put material back in that surface. So one of the primary areas of focus that we have taken is to say, take uh, look to positive indices. And again, we're not alone in this concept. One of the things that we stress is for anyone who's involved in water care, homeowners, service technicians, builders, remodelers, uh, plasters, whoever does a startup and whoever maintains water to learn and understand to utilize the saturation index. It is without a doubt, number one, recognized by every major trade association in the United States, and we strongly encourage its use. If you don't, you know, there's a real simple way that you don't have to worry about learning how to use or calculate the saturation index. Keep all of the parameters in the ideal range. If you keep all the parameters in the ideal range, you will have no problems. That's not Greg Garrett just saying that. I'll give you a quote. This is one of the best books written in the industry, and I teach from this book. And this book is the IPSA, the Independent Pool and Spa Association. It's their basic training manual, fantastic book. And in that book, there's a, there's a, a section on page 44 that says, the author says, if you keep all the levels in the ideal parameters, you will not have a problem. Absolutely correct. Now, take that statement and put it in the real world. You get storms, you get rains, you get things that are gonna change that. The normal ebb and flow of water over time. But remember, what do we encourage you to do as a way to mitigate this potential reaction? Keep the water in a slightly positive mode. And we're not the only one that, that says to do that. Again, APSP in their service tech manual, page 329, it says, the best preferred method of balancing water is to keep it in a slight positive indice. That's on 329 of this manual. Fantastic, because it says basically the same thing that we're saying. You'll find out very quickly that a lot of these sound water care uh, principles are not just something unique only to the National Plaster Council. And another thing I'd like to stress is that if you don't have a good test kit, be a homeowner, service person, whatever, or good test strips, then you're not going to be able to accurately diagnose and understand what's going on in your pool water. So if you were to say, uh, Greg, what are the steps that I can do to make sure that I never have an etching scenario? Real simple. Number one, get a quality test kit or test strips and use them with frequency. Regular regimen of care. That's number one. Understand how to use your test kit. Understand the nature of the products you're putting in the pool. If you're using stabilized chlorine or if your service person is, understand that over time you will get a gradual increase in the stabilizer or cyanuric acid content. When that level goes over 80 ppm, action must be taken to avoid reaching overstabilization. Let's go to the next subject in that same arena. People don't understand. This manufacturer, Taylor, which is my personal favorite, one of the things that the manufacturer recommends is that you should, when the level goes over 80, learn to do what's called a dilution of your cyanuric acid level to know where it's really at. Because if you don't know where it's really at, you're not going to be able to correctly calculate the saturation index. This is a tool that I use every day out in the field. This is called a 250 milliliter graduated cylinder, but you can achieve this result with any other device that can measure tap and pull water in equal volumes. This cylinder is marked, so what you do if your level is over 80, you take one part tap water, there is no stabilizer in tap water, you mix it with one part pull water, swirl, and mix, and then do your stabilizer test. And then you multiply by the sum of the parts. So if you got one part tap, one part pull, you retest. Let's say you get still over 80 ppm. What do you do then? Then you do two parts tap water. Again, no stabilizer in tap water. One part pull water. You swirl, mix, redo the test, and what? You multiply now by three. Again, the sum of the parts. So let's say you got a level of 70 after doing two parts tap, one part pool water. So what is your actual cyanuric acid or stabilizer level? 70 times 3 is 210. Now why is this important? 
because don't forget, you cannot use tested alkalinity to calculate saturation index, but only carbonate alkalinity. So what do you have to do? You have to, as a field rule, subtract approximately one-third of your stabilizer level, so one-third of 210 is 70 from your tested alkalinity. So let's say you had an alkalinity level that was tested of 100. You'd look at that and you go, hey, that's a great level. Everything is fine. In actuality, once you find out that your stabilizer is 210, you subtract out 70 from 100, your adjusted or carbonate or corrected alkalinity is 30. What does that do? That makes the water corrosive. And when the water gets corrosive, remember, it's that old adage, you cannot fool Mother Nature. The water says, I am undersaturated, I am, in, I am not in equilibrium, I am going to leach and find whatever I have to find to balance myself. Hey, I've got low calcium, that surface is chock full of calcium. I have low other constituents, where can I find it? The surface. But don't forget, low carbonate alkalinity will also affect things like metals in your equipment. Uh, it'll also affect your tau grout. So you need to be aware of this unique phenomena, and it's very, very common. I, I have looked at over 10,000 pools since 1969. The number one and number two things that I find throughout the United States, and I'm quoted on this in all the seminars I do on a, on a national basis, is number one, Low calcium fill never adjusted. Low calcium, I talked about the west side, 30 to 50. Everywhere I go, and I go to places and people go, oh, we don't have that problem. Do you mind if I test your tap water? What do I find? 50, 60. Remember, anything under 150 is considered aggressive. That's number one. Number two, people do not understand the concept of using only adjusted or carbonate alkalinity to calculate balance. And if you don't know how to make that calculation, and folks, we're not talking some calculus or advanced trigonometry, we're talking simple arithmetic. Take a test of your tap water, or excuse me, your pool water, test the alkalinity, test the cyanuric acid, get that level. If it's over 80, you have to do a dilution to ascertain that level, take one third of it, and guess what? determine what your carbonate alkalinity and then plug that variable into a set of calculations that involves testing your pH, carbonate alkalinity, calcium hardness, temperature of the water, and your total dissolved solids. Total dissolved solids we don't talk about much in our industry, but it's important, especially when what? Salt pools. Because people don't understand that salt in salt pools makes up part of your total dissolved solid. So in the saturation index, you, you look at the calcium hardness, the carbonate, not tested alkalinity, the pH of the water, you use the actual number itself, the other variables you assign parameters to, and as I was mentioning, the total dissolved solids, which are in many cases either measured with a TDS strip or an electronic meter. An electronic meter will pick it up and read it and tell you what that number is. And this is critical, especially on salt pools. The higher the TDS level, the higher the salt content in the water, usually the more corrosive the water becomes. And only because of one thing. People don't understand the relationship of elevated TDS, but if you look at it mathematically, the greater the TDS, the greater will be the factor or subtraction that you have to make to the other variables when you plug them in into the simple equation that we call the saturation index. And again, one other thing, and I gotta stress this, this is not just the MPC saying to use the saturation index. My favorite book, page 47 of this, talks about the one-third fill rule. Take one-third of the stabilizer, subtract it from the tested alkalinity to calculate carbonate or adjusted alkalinity. The CPO book on page 66 and 67 talks about this. APSP talks about it. The test kit that I have, the manufacturer talks about it in their technical bulletins and in their booklet that comes with the test kit. This is not a new concept and I gotta stress this to you. People always ask me, when was the first time they started seeing this? There's a very famous article that was written in 1975 by a Mr. Taylor that talked about the fact that 
this failure to make this adjustment for cyanuric or acid or stabilizer content can affect, in the words he used in this article in a magazine called Pool News, printed in January 1975, was it affects or has the potential to deteriorate masonry surfaces, plaster, grout, things of that nature. So you gotta remember, this is not a new concept. In 1995, the Chemical Treatment and Process Committee of APSP, which is now the RWQ, the Recreational Water Committee, of which I am on, released a fact sheet, a technical bulletin, an information bulletin that said, hey, if you have elevated cyanuric acid levels and low carbonate alkalinity, you get very corrosive water. That was published by APSP at that time, the National Pool and Spa Institute, NSPI, and now, which is APSP. So again, I stress, this is not a new concept. Yet, in many places I go, many people do not fully grasp or understand this concept. So. If